good evening everyone so i am dr pushkar so i am a second year dm neurology resident and uh, today's class so i'll be mainly focusing on uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders a little bit about anti mog and the variants of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis and also the clinical features presentation the diagnostic implications and uh, uh, the main parts of multiple sclerosis the treatment of multiple sclerosis i'll be covering in the other classes okay so <clears throat> this class will be mainly just like my other colleagues so we will uh, uh, have some uh, mcqs to have uh, some basic framework now coming to the first mcq so which of the following is not a core clinical characteristic of devic's disease so which of the following is not a core clinical uh, core clinical characteristic of devic's disease so devic's disease is the uh, synonym for neuromyelitis optica the older name for neuromyelitis optica so which of the following is not a core clinical characteristic okay so we'll wait for i think six have answered maybe at least if 20 have answered we will end the poll okay most of you seem to be getting it right i think there's a little confusion with nar narcolepsy but all right fine okay i want more at least 20 to participate so at least by the end of the class by the 30th mcq i hope most of you get All of it, uh, all most of it, at least eighty to ninety, get the uh, right answers. Okay, so that's great. So I think uh, most of you are answering it right. Okay, so we'll conclude. So most of you uh, have answered it right. More than fifty have answered it right. So which of the following is not a core clinical characteristic of neuromyelitis optica or Devic's disease? And the answer is. neuromyotonia so neuromyotonia is a separate neurological entity by itself and it's uh, out of the scope of discussion in this class so let's go into what are the core so obviously these three are core clinical characteristics that is optic neuritis narcolepsy and area postrema so these are the six important core clinical characteristics of neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder so as the name suggests neuromyelitis so transverse myelitis or acute myelitis is one core clinical feature and optica so optic neuritis so these two you are surely going to remember so the other four just uh, you'll have to remember so one is area postrema syndrome and the next one is acute brain stem syndrome and next is an acute diencephalic syndrome or a symptomatic narcolepsy and then is a symptomatic cerebral syndrome so this is very important because most of us are in the impression that nmst predominantly involves the optic nerves as well as the spinal cord but actually that's not so it even involves the cerebral uh, the cerebral structures also so and it has a predilection to involve the periependymal structure structures so basically in nmo it is because of antibodies to it is because of antibodies to acoporin 4 so this acoporin 4 is actually heavily expressed in the periependymal structures so that is the reason why it you have involvement in these regions so areas so area postrema is a periependymal structure so area postrema is nothing but the dorsal medulla it's it's present in the dorsal medulla and involvement usually presents with hiccups and vomiting okay and and many times we have actually seen cases where the only presentation has been only vomiting then eventually we get a multiple referrals from mg saying that it's not uh, uh, there is no nothing from their side and we take an mri there is a area postrema syndrome there is a t2 uh, flare hyper intensities in the dorsal medulla so that is very important then an acute brain stem syndrome so it can present with multiple uh, cranial palsies and acute diencephalic uh, syndrome which presents with narcolepsy okay and also uh, a symptomatic cerebral syndrome but usually the cerebral uh, involvement is uh, not very prominent but it is an important core clinical characteristics so don't forget these six optic neuritis acute myelitis area postrema syndrome acute brain stem syndrome symptomatic narcolepsy or acute diencephalic syndrome and a symptomatic cerebral syndrome so these are the six core clinical characteristics of neuromyelitis optica so let's go to question 2 so which of the following is the diagnostic criteria the named diagnostic criteria that is used in the diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica so this is a very important faq especially for those who are preparing for ness neurology uh, it's been asked multiple times i think it had uh, come in ness also once so great most of you seem to be answering it right it's a very important repeat question we we'll, okay in the length of poll right so more more than 50 have answered it right right okay so the answer is wingerchuk criteria so wingerchuk criteria is the named criteria that is used for neuromyelitis optica diagnosis so anyone in the chat box what is neuric criteria 
Pringle criteria and Avaji criteria. Anyone wants to try? Okay, so those who are preparing for INESS DM Neuro, it's very important. Yeah, good. So Mohammed Chandil has answered correctly. Avaji's criteria is for, oops, sorry. Yeah, Avaji criteria is for uh, MND. Great. What about Neuric criteria, guys? Neuric criteria and Pringle criteria? Okay, fine. So we'll uh, continue. So actually, Neuric criteria is used for the diagnosis of fronto temporal dementia. It's used for the diagnosis of fronto temporal dementia. And Pringle criteria is used for the diagnosis of primary lateral sclerosis. So primary lateral sclerosis is a type of motor neuron disease which predominantly involves upper motor neurons. So Pringle criteria is used for primary lateral sclerosis, Neuric criteria for frontotemporal dementia and Avaji criteria for MND. But don't forget the important one in this class, Wingacha criteria for neuromyelitis optica. Okay. So most of you have got it right. So that's great. Okay. So let's go to question number three. So what percentage of patients with NMO will have anti acoporin 4 positivity? Uh, the reason I put up this MCQ because this is a change from the earlier edition. The earlier edition had a different answer and the latest edition of Harrison has a different answer. And uh, it's good that they've updated it. Actually, uh, anti acoporin 4 is a very, very sensitive as well as specific antibody for NMOSD. We can check it both in the serum as well as in the CSF. But uh, you know, this question is mainly serum at acoporin 4. And it's great that many of you are trying as well as getting the right answer. Okay, I think there is a few have answered the answer from the old edition. That's all right. Okay, so we'll close the poll. We'll end the poll. Okay, uh, fine. I, okay, I think most of you have answered 80. That's close, but actually the answer is uh, 90 percentage. So, yes. So 90 percentage. So 90 percentage of patients with NMO will have a positive anti acoporin 4 antibody. And very, very important is what is the technique that we use to detect this antibody? So this is also an important MCQ. We use the cell-based assay. We use the cell-based assay. Okay, there are certain labs that actually use ELISA, but please make sure whenever you are requesting. I think uh, most of uh, many of many of the many of the many of your people here uh, might be sending your samples to Nimans. So Nimans actually does the cell-based assay, and uh, that's very very important. It's much more superior to ELISA. So yes, this is uh, taken from Harrison. So anti acoporin 4 antibodies are present in the sera of 90% of the patients. So in the earlier edition of Harrison's actually that mentioned 70, but this is a change. Don't, don't forget, it's actually 90 percentage. It's highly specific as well as sensitive. All right. Okay, question number four. We'll open the polls. So which of the following is false regarding the diagnosis of zero negative NMOSD? Okay, which of the following is false regarding the diagnosis of zero negative NMOSD as per the Wingerchuk's criteria? So is it exclusion of alternate diagnosis? Is it symptomatic narcolepsy plus an acute brainstem syndrome? Is it dissemination in space? or is an optic neuritis for symptomatic cerebral syndrome. So again, this question is to highlight that the diagnostic criteria is different for a zero positive NMO as well as a zero negative NMO. Okay. So I think this comes will be rank deciding. I think a little difficult if you are getting it right. Okay. So uh, most of you have actually tick C. Okay. So let's go into the diagnostic criteria and then come back and answer this question. All right. Okay, so this is the diagnostic criteria for a patient with NMOSD who is acoporin 4 negative or has an unknown acoporin 4 IgG status. So the most important thing is the patient should have two core clinical characteristics okay, that occur as a result of one or more clinical attacks and of which at least one of the core clinical characteristics. So I think all of you remember what are the core clinical characteristics. It's optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, area post syndrome. A symptomatic narcolepsy, a symptomatic cerebral syndrome, okay, and an acute brainstem syndrome. So these are the six core clinical characteristics. And for a zero negative NMOSD, we need two of these core clinical characteristics, of which one should be an optic neuritis, an acute myelitis, or an area posthumous syndrome. So this is very, very important. At least one of these should be present if it is zero negative. There should be dissemination in space. And there should be fulfillment of additional MRI criteria, which I will come to right now. And the negative test for anti-acoporin 4 should be done using the best available technique. And the best available technique is 
सेल बेस्ड असे ओके द बेस्ट द मोस्ट बेस्ट डिटेक्शन मेथड इज अ सेल बेस्ड असे and there should be exclusion of alternative diagnosis so now let's go back to the mcq so exclusion of alternative diagnosis yes so this is true it's not a false option symptomatic narcolepsy plus acute brain stem lesion so this is the answer because even though there are two core clinical criteria in this patient it does it does not include optic neuritis or transverse myelitis or area posterior syndrome because this at least one of the two core clinical uh, clinical criteria should be an optic neuritis or a myelitis or a area posterior syndrome so this is the answer that is it is a false option and dissemination space yes that is true and yes optic neuritis plus a symptomatic cerebral syndrome yes so optic neuritis is there so at least this is there in one of the core clinical criteria and a plus a symptomatic cerebral syndrome okay so don't forget this is there in this table is there in harrison it's very important you could get an mcq from here and let's go into what are the additional mri requirements okay so basically in additional mri requirements for the optic nerve so number one the patient should have an optic nerve lesion that is longitudinally extensive okay so just is just like how you have longitudinally ex extensive lesion in the spinal cord we have a similar thing in the optic nerve so it should involve more than 50 percentage of the optic nerve length or it should involve the optic chiasm okay and remember this additional mri requirements is only for zero negative nmst not for zero positive if zero positive it's totally different it's very easy to make the diagnosis i'll come to that so additional mri criteria remember more than 50% of the optic nerve or the optic chiasm should be involved and the patient should have a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis that is involvement of three or more contiguous segments okay and or the mri is showing a focal spinal cord atrophy in patients who having a history of acute myelitis but just remember letm okay so a longitudinally extensive optic neuritis a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis and a patient who is having area posterior syndrome that is dorsal medulla involvement and acute brain stem syndrome with periependymal brain stem lesion so as i mentioned uh, nmosd has a predilection to involve the periependymal brain stem lesion so this is how we have to diagnose a case who is zero negative acoporin 4 igg but has very strong clinical features of nmosd so how do you diagnose a patient who is zero positive okay so a patient is zero positive for acoporin 4 igg antibodies any one okay any one core clinical characteristic is enough any one it could be a diencephalic syndrome it could be a symptomatic cerebral syndrome or it could be a area posterior syndrome anything nothing specific and the positive testing for the acoporin 4 igg should be done by a cell based assay okay don't forget this cell based assay and exclusion of alternative diagnosis so diagnosing a zero positive nmosd is much more simple you just need one core clinical characteristic and excluding alternative diagnosis and a cell based assay positive antibody test so let's go to the next question so let's open the polls which of the following statements is false regarding neuromyelitis optica so option number 1 it is more frequent in women compared to men progressive symptoms are common the optic neuritis is bilateral and severe and oligo oligoclonal bands are uncommon so i guess this is a little tough one i think uh, very few are getting it right but that's all right okay so we'll conclude okay so most of you have answered d okay so the question is what is which of the following is false so oligoclonal bands uh, uncommon actually is true okay so oligoclonal bands are actually present in less than 20 percentage of patients with nmosd okay so most of you have answered d okay but actually uh, no oligoclonal bands are actually uncommon in nmosd it's more seen in multiple sclerosis so let's uh, analyze option 3 optic neuritis is bilateral and severe yes that is true and progressive symptoms are common okay so remember that in nmosd it is more of a relapsing and remitting illness it is a disease that relapses remits relapses and remits it it's very unusual for an nmosd to have progressive symptoms progressive symptoms is more in favor of multiple sclerosis okay so multiple sclerosis is more for progressive symptoms so this is actually the answer this is the false statement and it is more frequent in women compared to men so yes it is true of any other demyelinating or autoimmune illness so it is much more common in women so this question is to highlight the demographic features of nmosd so females more than males just like in multiple sclerosis the onset is little more later than multiple sclerosis so usually ms if you take multiple sclerosis the onset is from 20 to 40 years okay usually uh, relapsing relating remitting ms usually has a 20 to 40 years onset but actually if you take a primary progressive ms actually it is 40 years but if you take ms in the whole sense usually ms has a younger age of onset but nmosd is usually a disease of adulthood usually in 40 years of age and yes the optic neuritis is bilateral and severe 
the as discussed earlier and the myelitis is very severe longitudinally extensive that it involves three or more vertebral segment contiguous vertebral segments and very important that is one in our question unlike in multiple sclerosis progressive symptoms is not a feature of nmo progressive features is a feature of multiple sclerosis and the csf exam in neuromyelitis optica oligoclonal bands is an uncommon feature it is present only in less than 20 percentage of patients and we can have some cells okay that is pleocytosis so you can have some cells in nmsd and usually these cells are neutrophils usually these cells are neutrophils and eosinophils okay so to conclude ocbs are uncommon and progressive symptoms are uncommon and as to the demographic data as we have discussed okay so we'll go to question number 6 so what is the classical enhancement pattern of the cerebral lesions okay of the cerebral lesions in the mra brain in devix disease so devix disease is nothing but the i think most of you already know it's a synonym for okay good we have many people giving the right answer that's great it's given only in very passing mention in harrison but it's important since it's a named uh, it's a named imaging feature so it's very likely to be an mcq great most of you are giving the right answer so cerebral lesions enhancement pattern okay we'll conclude the polls good 40% of you have given the right answer and it is cloud like lesions okay it is cloud like lesions so anyone in the chat box wants to see wants to answer which demyelinating illness you get a concentric pattern anyone wants to try yeah world in ms um, okay that's new but i, I don't think so uh, anyone uh, what about concentric pattern anyone wants to try okay fine so i'll give the answer in this so actually concentric pattern you get it in bellows bellows concentric sclerosis okay you get it in bellows concentric sclerosis as the name suggests but so don't forget cloud like lesions okay the enhancement pattern is cloud like lesions so this has mentioned in harrison so large mr lesions in nmst in the cerebral hemisphere even though they are asymptomatic most of the times they can have a cloud like appearance or enhancement pattern but however unlike in multiple sclerosis the cerebral lesions are not very destructive it's usually the optic nerve lesions and the spinal cord lesions which are destructive so this is from uh, an article from ito s et al so anyone anyone any idea what sequence of mri this is okay so actually this is mri brain axial view and this is a t1 weighted image post gadolinium contrast okay so here we can see this is the classically dis uh, described cloud like enhancement pattern in ito's article which is meant, which was published in 2009 so this is the cloud like pattern we see in nmst so just don't forget that uh, name i, th I think it's very unlikely you would get an image question for as like this but i just wanted to show out of interest 